I'm Dilip Menezes, Managing Director of 3D Systems India. And this is a presentation about direct digital molding using our figure four 3D printing platform. The purpose of this presentation is to introduce a concept whereby we can see that 3D printing can be used to completely replace vacuum casting. And in some cases where it makes sense, it can be used to replace injection molding as well. Let's start. First, a slide about our company. This is a man called Chuck Hull. He invented 3D printing in 1983. This is the first part of a printer. This is one of our first printers. This is Chuck Hull receiving one of the many Lifetime Achievement Awards. Chuck started 3D Systems in 1986. We are around 2,600 odd employees spread across the world. We are a very technology centric company as can be seen by the number of global patents. In fact, uh, at one point of time, we had more patents than employees. That's not the case anymore. We're headquartered in Rock Hill, South Carolina in the US. Just a slide about uh, the various industries that we operate in. So these are the major industries, healthcare, dental, aerospace, automotive, and durable goods. There are other smaller industries as well, like jewelry, jigs and fixtures, and casting. But these are the main five verticals where our products are aligned. Okay, let's talk about 3D printing versus injection molding. This is a graph that has got unit time on the y-axis and uh, time, basically the last 20 years along the x-axis. You can see that uh, the amount of time it takes to injection mold parts is kind of decreased over the years. But the decrease in the amount of time it takes to 3D print parts has been far, far more drastic. And we'll speak about that in the coming slides. So if you look at the orange curve, which represents injection molding, the cost per part initially is very high when the quantity is low. That is because the cost of the injection molded tool needs to be apportioned over a smaller number of quantity of parts. But as you use the tool to manufacture more and more parts, you see the cost per part drastically reduces. If you look at the green section here, there's also um, a case wherein it doesn't make sense to go for injection molding, but rather you use a vacuum casting for maybe a shorter run production, maybe 400, 500 parts. Look at this blue line, which is basically flat. This represents the unit cost for 3D printing using the figure four. It is basically flat. If you print one part, it's going to cost you X. If you print a thousand parts, it'll, it'll cost you X and also more than that. Where these two curves intersect is where you need to pay attention. So over the next few slides, you'll see where it makes sense to use 3D printing to manufacture parts and where it makes sense to use injection molding. One rule of thumb is basically wherever it, it made sense to use vacuum casting, that can easily be done by 3D printing. And certain uh, portion of injection molding also can be taken over by, by 3D printing. And the rest of the presentation is an explanation of how that's possible. Before we talk about uh, the figure four, let's talk about how 3D printing has been used at a, as a manufacturing tool over the years. So this is about a decade ago. Uh, we had a customer who wanted, uh, who urgently wanted a large number of parts. So we used SLS, one of our 3D printing technologies, to print around a thousand parts and it, it took us around five hours. That came to 18 seconds per part, which is actually nice, but what you don't see here is the cost per part. It was huge, but it made sense because it was an emergency. This is uh, around seven years ago. This used uh, another technology called SLA. We, we printed around the 640 parts. As you can see, we completely optimized the build volume of the, of the printer. Again, here it made sense because it was an emergency, but it didn't make sense to continuously produce parts like this way. Here's another case of bridge manufacturing. So basically bridge manufacturing is a term used to uh, manufacture parts in an alternate way 
till the time you get the stuff in place to manufacture it using the regular way. So this was an automotive part. Uh, there was a last minute change in the design and uh, there was no time to wait for the new tooling. So till the time the new tooling was made, we, we printed a large number of parts for this customer. I'll come back to these slides uh, in the middle of the presentation when I explain to you how 3D printing was used as a manufacturing process back then and how it is being used now and what is different. So let's talk about the figure for modular. So it's called modular because it consists of a controller and each one of these is a module. So one controller can control up to 24 modules. Each module has got a print engine and uh, each print engine can print using one material. So you, you can have a setup where you have multiple modules printing using multiple materials and even printing different kinds of parts, like a mini factory. So this is the build volume. So this is important. So it can print up to 100 mm per hour. Now in the 3D printing world, this is very fast. So a setup like this can print around 10,000 parts per month. The material is fed automatically. So basically you open this dough and you insert a cartridge of the material, close it, and then the printer pumps up how much material it wants. If you can see here, if you are used to seeing a 3D printed parts, you'll often notice an artifact like lines, like build lines, which will tell you uh, in, at what angle the part was actually printed on the platform. But using uh, this printer, the figure four, you can't really know because the surface finish is as good as injection molded parts. So the other aspect of direct digital molding is this concept of production materials. So let me talk about the difference between a prototyping material and a production material. A prototyping material uh, maintains its properties uh, for some time. A production material maintains its properties for a very long time. So prototyping materials tend to uh, bend, warp, or sometimes turn brittle over time due to the added exposure of UV light over time. But uh, these materials that we have invented, they have long-term UV stability, which means that these can uh, last in a production environment for many years, like an injection molded part should. Another nice thing about these materials is that they have thermoplastic-like mechanical properties. So if you look at this bar here, it, it went through a tensile test, so it was pulled from both sides. But before it broke, there was necking. So necking is when uh, the material turns thinner here and then breaks. Uh, re regular the 3D printing materials, they just fracture. So this is a good property which is expected in an ABS kind of a material. Uh, the HDT is quite high, which means that this can uh, this can withstand high environmental temperatures and also operating temperatures. It's got a good elongation and break as well. So a good example of where this material can be used as a production material is motor housings, so connectors, or snap fits, stuff like that. This is an automotive part. Not sure if you can see uh, this part over here, but it's got kind of a texture. So this texture was actually embedded in the CAD model itself. So this printer is quite accurate. It can actually print a leather kind of a texture on the part. This is a slide, uh, it's, uh, it's quite important. So 3D printing companies uh, in the past and including 3D systems, we have been notorious to uh, talk only about the good good properties of our materials. So uh, if something, if there was a property that was good, then we used, to, we used to mention it in our data sheets. Stuff that wasn't that good, we used to sometimes hide it. Uh, and that's all of us, all companies. Now, as we move into the production world, we have realized that this, this won't work. When you're talking to an engineer, you have to come clean and you have to explain to him, okay, this is my material. These are all the properties. These are the standards that we have tested it against. And these are all the values. Now, you may like these values, you may not like these values. 
you may like certain value of a certain property uh, of a certain material or you may like something else from a different material but the point is it's our job if we are talking about a production application not a prototyping application if this is production if you are going to take a decision to use a particular material as a production material to build parts to be used in your products for life then you need to have the right value so all our materials have all the data points which are important whether they are good or they are bad there are a wide range of materials in our in our figure 4 portfolio they they are broadly classified into three categories production indirect production and prototyping towards the end of the presentation i will get into the details of each of the materials but for now i'll just run you through them so we spoke about the probe black like 10 already there is a flexible material there are a couple of rubber materials there's a very interesting high temperature material this has got a hd of the, the 300 degrees there are also medical grade materials in fact all the materials with a star are medical grade so when you say a production materials it means that the parts which are printed using these materials are the actual end use parts for indirect production the parts that you print using these materials are not the end use parts but they are used in the making of the end use parts like uh, for example j cas green this is basically our jewelry material so you print the jewelry pattern using this material and then you use that pattern in a investment casting process to cast the precious metal then we have the prototyping materials so we have tough materials we have elastomeric materials and so flexible materials these are good for prototyping so you can use this to test your design and stuff like that but you really can't use this for production because these materials over time they will change properties and then your parts can fail or not perform as you want them to so okay so i've i've said a lot of things about uh, a new printer new material uh, you know it's it's good for production it prints very fast and i made a lot of claims so let me walk you through an example of how we actually used our printer to print thousands of parts uh very quickly so this is basically a set of parts this is an automotive part it relates to a windshield washer so there is a zip tie that goes through this part and comes out from here then there's a washer which sits here and a bolt goes in to secure the part onto the car and here's a sensor that's bolted inside now if you look at this design very closely and ask yourself how are you going to plastic injection mold this part how i mean how are you going to make the mold you'll find that it's going to be impossible or very 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 difficult so which begs the question why did the designer design this part in this way so actually this part was an assembly of four parts and those were made for injection molding so what the designer did here in this case was basically did an assembly consolidation he knew that he had the design freedom of 3d printing so he he decided to use that and consolidated all those four parts to make it into one so if we print this there's no need to have to to maintain those four molds and uh, you get a lot of other advantages as well so this is a part that we wanted to give as a handout to all the people who visited our booth at form next what this meant was we needed a lot of them like thousands of them and we needed them soon in like in a week so we asked our team of advanced application engineers in san diego to print thousands of these parts and ship them to frankfurt and they had about a week to do it so this is a story of how this was done okay so let's see first things first they uh, did a complete stack build so this is the build volume of the figure for modular and as you can see they used all the space that they could possibly use to print as many parts as they could because this was a production application here's a video which shows you how this printer works This is the vat of resin. 
there's UV light that gets flashed from underneath and it cures layer by layer. So these parts are printed or shut down. That's how this works. So you see in about five hours, we printed 120 parts. So here's a slide that shows you how we op optimize this build. So we, we had to use the supports because uh, parts were stacked up on top of each other. So we use these very fine, small supports to hold these parts. Also, we used the supports to uh, hold adjacent parts, as you can see over here. After printing, let's talk about the post-processing. So it needs to be washed for 10 minutes and then dried for three minutes and then cured for two minutes. So the curing is important because uh, when we print, the curing in the printer is about 80% or so. And then after it is washed and dried, it, it needs to be cured till 100% to get its complete properties. Support removal. So uh, all these parts needed to have their supports removed. Now these were thousands of parts and it would be very cumbersome and very time time consuming for our engineers to spend their time to take out the supports manually of each of these parts. So one of our guys had this brilliant idea of uh, taking the entire build, putting it in a cardboard box and tumbling it for 20 minutes in this uh, powder mixer. So this powder mixer is uh, used to mix the powder of our SLS machines in the lab. And after tumbling it for 20 minutes, this was the result. 100% of all the supports were automatically removed. And this, since this is a tough material, all the tumbling didn't, didn't uh, damage the parts. So we used Geomagic Control X, which is our inspection software, to check the accuracy of the printed parts. And as you can see, it's all in the OK zone. And let's talk about the material wastage. So as you can see, due to the fact that we uh, optimized the build completely using the minimal amount of supports, we had a 95.6% utilization of material. Now, this is important because this material is not cheap. So let me take you back to the initial three slides where I showed you how we did manufacturing using 3D printing in the past, wherein it was an emergency kind of situation. And then uh, although the cost was very high, we said it's okay because we need it right now. So let's spend the money, but have these parts immediately. But look at this now. The material cost for this part is just 25 rupees. For this one, it is 121 rupees. The machine cost is constant, it is 9. So this cost is basically the cost of the machine, the cost of labor, the cost of power, the cost of rent, and your bank interest, and everything. So you, 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 you add up all of that, and then you apportion it over time, and then you get a fixed cost. So the part cost of this is 34 rupees, and this is like 130. As you can see, it's not expensive at all. So after 24 hours, this is what our production looked like. And after 48 hours, this is what it looked like. Thousands of parts. Okay, so I've spoken about how we use the figure for modeler to print thousands of parts very quickly. And we are saying that they are production parts and you know it can be used in a machine, but so let's take a look at this. This is the figure four. And this part you see, which is highlighted over here, this part is actually 3D printed on the figure four itself. And why not? We need just maybe a few thousands of them a year. Uh, using the modular, using one modular, we can, I, I can print 10,000 parts a month. So why not, why not print it? Uh, uh, this also gives you the freedom of design changes. So if you want to change the design and move this hole in the front or change this angle from a 90 to say a 60 or 95, uh, two things happen. One, all the parts that you have in your inventory, they are all gone to waste. Then you have to tell your supplier, okay, here's the new, new design and uh, get me another 500, 600 parts. Uh, what that means is he'll take two, three weeks to do the tooling and then he'll start the production later on. 
in the meantime if this was a critical part i mean if your if your if your machine was failing because of this then you can't really continue production you have to stop it until you get the new parts the other thing is inventory management becomes very easy so we don't have any inventory of these parts whenever we need them we just print them so this is true just in time inventory okay so let's talk about the possibilities over here uh, first and foremost it is possible to manufacture parts which cannot be injection molded or which are very difficult to be to be injection molded uh, this is a glowing example of this this part is also a nice example showing assembly consolidation so like i said this was actually a part comprised of four components which was made into one this enables you to save time and cost which makes you more competitive so if you're a designer you should start asking yourself are you ready for design for additive manufacturing do you know the rules of 3d printing like the other other manufacturing uh, technologies have their own rules like casting has its own rules uh, cnc machining molding do you know the rules of additive manufacturing do you know that you have design freedom that you can use to come up with some really interesting designs now if you are an oem if you make products you should maybe start investigate possible candidates parts which can be printed in sort of injection molded so if you're a supplier you need to ask yourself you know how can this help me how can this make me more competitive uh, what are the main challenges that you face i mean you have a customer who comes to you and say look i i need 5000 parts and i need them quick and uh, you tell him yes i can give you but then it'll take time because i have to cut the mold i have to do all kinds of stuff and then he says no no i i need this immediately soon uh, but with this tool in your in your portfolio you can go back to him and say yes of course i can give 5000 parts I'll, I'll charge you double and he may say yes so you can actually increase your bottom line and win more business so all this time i was talking about the figure 4 modular however this slide uh, i would like to introduce the entire figure 4 family so this is the figure 4 standalone this is uh, basically one of these modules here i i had mentioned earlier that the material feeding is automatic here it is manual so you have to open the lid and actually uh, pour material from a bottle the purpose of this is uh, flexibility so this is mainly used for r&d you would want to try out new designs try out new materials quickly you know in the morning print one part for lunch time print another print another part in another material uh, maybe in the evening do something else maybe at overnight print a fourth kind of a part all this can be done in the standalone so you can print maybe 200 parts a week if you need to you can do like really small run productions uh but where this technology shines is in the modular so once you identify which part you can print and which material and which orientation or uh, which kind of a configuration that's when you can shift the production to a modular and this can be a factory and the nice thing is that you don't need a you know industrial floor for this this can sit in the corner of your office uh, in fact this can sit in your r&d office itself if you want to bring in production of certain parts maybe you have suppliers who never meet their deadlines and there's there's quality issues and you have all these issues uh, you can choose to bring some of the production in house itself or you can uh, validate your designs using the stand alone which is in your r&d office and then maybe find a supplier who has a modular and then uh, ask him to print them for you if you are a uh, injection molding uh, company you can look at investing in a modular to have this flexibility now when things get really uh, huge is in the figure for production so this is uh, far more complicated so in each of these modules there are four print engines and actually you can have robotic arms inside which pick and place platforms take them to wash to dry to cure and basically this is a configurable product uh, so how this works is our engineers will need to come and see your factory understand exactly what you want to do 
and then custom build a configuration that works for you. This is able to print around a million parts a year. Now, this is not a dream of the future. This is already happening. We have customers who have the figure for production. We have, so these guys uh, started using the stand on long time ago and uh, they validated their, their, their business and they validated their parts. They started using the modular. It went into quite large productions and then they finally moved to the production. So basically these are parts which can maybe only be 3D printed now and they have actually decided to go ahead with this. So this is a complete upgrade path. So what we're talking here is we have the printer, which is fast. We have the material, which is a production material. And we have a setup where you can do R&D, then move to mid-level production. And if things really work out for you, then you can go into complete full bone production. Uh, since this is a season of COVID, uh, just want to add a slide about how the figure four has been uh, uh, involved in the fight against COVID. So we have the Med Amber 10 material, which is medical grade. So it has been used to uh, the 3D print uh, nasal swabs, uh, ventilator splitters, uh, venturi valves, and stuff like that. So actually, this has saved lives. So there was this case in Italy, northern Italy, when the pandemic just hit. Um, they ran out of venturi valves. So, so this, this is a venturi valve. This goes on the face mask of the patient and it's a consumable. So once you use it on one patient, you have to, you have to throw it out. Um, and the hospital uh, ran out of these venturi valves and uh, they had a problem. So one of our customers uh, basically took his 3D scanner to the hospital, scanned one of the venturi valves and then printed it using uh, our SLS printer and that actually saved lives because these valves were stuck in transit they were to come from china or someplace and it was just not working so then later our team from san diego got involved and they optimized the design for the figure four so i'd like to talk about just one customer story i don't want to give you uh, five or ten stories uh, which show you five ten different things Here's a very nice story about uh, a customer who wanted to make a lab on a chip kind of a, a device for pathogen detection. So this is like a device that can check for COVID-19, you know, dengue, malaria, stuff like that. So the way this lab on a chip works is you take a chip, you put it in the device, and then you place this cartridge over it and you drop the sample from the patient onto the cartridge and the sample is then led to different parts of the chip and then the reading happens. So this is the zoomed out view of the chip. So you can see this, this has got two micro channels. So one drop is dropped here and the sample goes through and sits on this part of the chip, which is underneath. Another drop is placed here and goes and sits on this part of the chip. And if you notice this scale, zero to one, this is one mm. So this is basically a few microns thin, and this is the accuracy of the figure four. It can print micro channels, which are so small. And the reason why we had to use the Med Amber 10 material is because it is biocompatible. We couldn't use the other materials because uh, uh, we don't want the sample to be contaminated. Now this was printed, right? So let's look at the other parts of the device. This enclosure was printed using the Pro Black 10. Then there are some other elastomeric and flexible parts as well. Those were printed using the Rubber 65A and the FlexPack 20. So basically, apart from the electronics and these small nuts and bolts hardware, the entire device is 3D printed. And here's the best part. It wasn't 3D printed only for prototyping. It was 3D printed for production as well. What this means is there is no mold made for this entire, entire device. Uh, the entire production happens using a 3D printer and completely on the figure four. Now, this lends itself well. Why? Because first of all, it can be printed. So why not? And also, this is a new product. So there are going to be a lot of design changes over time. So they just send the new design to the printer and they have a next part. 
So this is a nice example of a one printer with multiple materials that serve multiple purposes was able to be used to print a complete product. This is really a compelling case of the figure four. This is basically where I uh, end my presentation, but I've got a few helper slides and, I, and I've spoken about how I'm gonna talk about each material. So this is the Pro Black 10, we've spoken a lot about it. So this is another uh, flexible black production material which is used for automotive styling and the consumer goods. This is the rubber 65A black material. So what you see here is uh, the hand grips of a motorcycle. So you can actually print them and uh, put it on the motorcycle and uh, ride it for years. It's, it's, it's a production material, it's fine. It's got a sure hardness of 65A. This is a rubber black production material. It's got low rebound as you can see in the video. So this is a very interesting material. It's called uh, high temp 300. Uh, the HDT is over 300 degrees centigrade. Now we say over 300 because actually we don't know what the HDT actually is. Uh, the reason I say that is because the lab equipment which is used to test HDT maxes out at 300. So how it works is you have a container of oil and then you heat the oil and every uh, 10 degrees or so, you dip your part into the oil and check if it's uh, if it's melting or bending or uh, disintegrating. So at a 300 degree centigrade, the oil starts to boil and then it becomes a fire hazard. So you can't really heat the oil more than 300 degree centigrade. And uh, even at 300 degree centigrade, uh, when we dipped our part inside, nothing happened to it. So we don't really know what the real HDT is but uh, since we had to put a number on our data sheet, so we went with 300. So this has got some very interesting applications, as you can see. This is the med amber 10 material. This is the one used for the COVID applications. So this is capable of meeting the these ISO standards so for cytotoxicity, sensorization, and irritation. The nice thing about this material is that it is sterilizable by autoclave. So these parts can go into a human body for, for a short period of time. So this is very nice to print uh, surgical guides uh, and instruments like this. This is, this is the medical white material. Eggshell amber, this is a very interesting application. So eggshell molding is a process where, uh, well, say if you want this part of say, silicon, uh, what you do is you take the CAD model of this and then you offset it by a few microns. And then you print the offset. And in that offsetted model, you inject the silicone inside, okay, at high temperature and pressure. So this material is able to withstand the high temperature and pressure involved in the injection of liquid silicone. Now, when it cools, this material is intentionally made brittle to shatter. So basically, you crush this in your with your hand, uh, and then the the 3D print breaks off. So it's like peeling a boiled egg. This is basically the shell, and this is basically the egg that you want. j screen. this is a indirect production material as well. Um, so this is what I was saying earlier. You print the jewelry pattern using this material. It's a castable material. And then you use investment casting to cast the precious metal. This is a very interesting material. So this we call the Jewel Master Gray. Uh, this material is very accurate. So we can print at uh, 10 micron layer thickness. Now, why would we want to do that? So imagine if uh, you want to manufacture 400 of these rings, exact same design, but 400. Uh, it may not make sense to use this material to print 400 of these. So what you can do is use this material to print just one pattern a very accurate pattern, and then uh, use it to make a silicon mold. Then in the silicon mold, you can inject wax and make uh, 500 wax patterns, which can, you can then use to do the investment casting. This can also be used to test the, the placement of uh, precious stones. So why this needs to be accurate? Because imagine if you are going to uh, cast 500 of these rings, and if the surface is not good, then what you'll end up 
equipped with is 500 rings which need to be polished quite a bit. And when you polish, you are basically losing gold. It's a gold dust that's flying out and you can't, you can't save it. And that's a lot of money. So for our large customers who basically cast uh, tons of gold a year, they need something that is really, really accurate. Now, the interesting thing about this material is we have called it Jewel Master Grey, but uh, this is actually a high temp material. So again, this has an HDT of 300. It is also a biocompatible material. So, you know, a combination of these two can lead to some very interesting applications. This is what we have thought of, like Jewel Master, but uh, customers can use these, uh, these materials for all kinds of things. These are the prototyping materials. This is the tough material. Uh, there's a tough gray 10, a tough gray 15. There's an elastomeric material. This has got high rebound. There's a flex black material. This is good for stuff like buckles, like a snap fit items. So this is basically a, a, a pipe is going to be here and this is going to snap fit into it. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, these are my contact details. Uh, if you have any questions, drop me a line or uh, place a comment down below and I'll try and answer as best as I can. Thank you.